Hello, welcome to a new series of projects. So I've got a camping trip that I want to go on and I thought it might be fun to make some of my own camping gear. So I've got four things that I want to make and if they're any good, I'll take them with me. This was inspired by finding these two articles online. They're really old and hopefully out of copyright. <laughs> they're reprints from Boys Life magazine and I think they're from the late 40s, that kind of era. They're aimed at the American Boy Scouts and I could date them because they mentioned the second National Jamboree which um, a quick look online said was held in 1950 so these are pre-1950 and what's really nice is they're utterly DIY so in here it's got preparing for the trip to the Jamboree all the kit that you're going to need to camp there and how to make just about all of that kit I'm not going to make all of it, I'm going to pick one thing from each article and I've got a couple of other things that I want to have a go at as well. The first thing though is going to be the tent, which is here. And well as they put it here, it's just a plain 6 by 11 foot tarp put up in a fancy way. And you can see in this picture, this is the uh, outer perimeter of it and then it's got some tape sewn into it. And I was just quite intrigued by, by this, it seems overly complicated and the tarp seems quite large but I thought why not give this a shot. This is my starting point for the tent, the material that I'm going to use. It's nothing more than a decorator's dust sheet or drop cloth and it's pure cotton, very open weave <laughs> and I'm really intrigued to see if I can waterproof this because that's going to be part of the process is applying a really 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 old-fashioned type of waterproofing to this. Before I do anything else though, I'm going to wash this. Um, I'm going to put it through the washing machine on a boil wash and try and shrink the weave a bit. So if I hold it up there, you can see how open that weave is. So to give myself a better chance of waterproof now, I'm going to try and, well, I don't know, I don't know anything about fabric, but I, I'm assuming if I boil wash it, it might shrink the weave a bit and give us a better chance. This is just one long length, it's 24 foot long by 3 foot wide and I bought it like that so that the when I sew it together to make an 11 foot by 6 foot sheet the seams will be in the right place. and leave that for a quite considerable time. We'll talk about falling at the first hurdle. <laughs> I knew the moment I pulled this out of the washing machine and went to hang it up and we've got an issue. I'm presuming this was three foot wide this strip. It is a presumption. I didn't measure it before washing it but it's definitely not three foot now. At best if I stretch it I'll get 32 inches out of it so it's lost that much in width which makes it useless now. Um, what we need to end up with is something that's 11 foot long and 6 foot wide. On the other hand <laughs> it has closed up the weave considerably. Now I do have another dust sheet um, which is much bigger, it's a, it's a rectangle rather than a long strip. Um, I didn't use this one because I figured that it would have seams in it in places that I probably wouldn't want them. So I haven't actually laid it out yet, but let's let's find out. So this one is 12 foot by 9 foot, so shrinking this it will still be oversized. Like I say, I assume there would be a seam in it somewhere. It doesn't look like there is though, that's really interesting. That's unexpected, there's no seams on this sheet, which is great. I had no idea they weave them so so wide or so long without seams. Shows what I know about fabric. This time round I'm going to measure it and then we'll wash it and I'll measure it again and we'll I'll be able to work out the percentage shrinkage. It'll also tell us how accurate the uh, the, the packet is. Uh, 
that's 11 foot at that mark so we're just a shade under 11 foot this is supposed to be a 12 foot long cloth what a rip off <laughs> I've been I've been had 106 inches I'm going to mostly work in Imperial because all the instructions in my 1940s uh, American <laughs> articles are of course in Imperial well there's sheet number two it's all been washed and uh, on the line drying out I'll give that a few hours we'll lay it on the floor and measure it see how much it's shrunk by 93 and see about stretching it too much So this too has shrunk massively, but in the in the lengthways direction, it's shrunk hugely. Um, widthways, I don't think it's shrunk that much. But I'm just going to have to go with that. And <laughs> we're already on the backup sheet. As you can tell, I'm completely unused to working with cloth. It's pretty much not my medium. I mean, you can't hit it with a hammer for one thing. Well, actually, you can. We'll be doing that in a bit. <laughs> Uh, I've got to put grommets in this, so I will be hitting it with a hammer. So I'll show you the entire set of instructions now, it's not going to take long. Well, in fact, the entire set of instructions are here. We've got eight steps. One, lay out material and cut. Two, sew into a 6x11 rectangle. I kind of failed with that one. Three, mark and sew on tapes. Now, it wants tapes to go where these lines are. These should all be tapes sewn onto the top. Four, sew on patches, and by patches I think they mean all these bits here where the grommets are going to go. So they get little reinforcement patches about that square. Um, five, sew the hems. So I'm guessing that's hem it all the way round the outside. Six, set the grommets. Seven, attach the ropes. Eight, go camping. And then the other page. It's just some pictures and a little diagram on how it's put up. I'm quite intrigued as to whether that's how it was back then. I could imagine, because this is for Boy Scouts, giving such such terse instructions there. It is all part of the uh, using your initiative and, and, and so forth. Uh, learning by working it out for yourself, which is what I'm going to have to do. Well, here's the beast. It's a Frista Rossman Beaver 3. I found it in a skip, uh, probably about a dozen years ago. Last year, when I first thought about doing this project, I finally pulled this out and then spent ages trying to just thread it. <laughs> and to download a manual just to tell me how to do that. So that's part of the idea of all this. It'll be an excellent learning experience. <laughs> as long as I don't get too upset with it. Right, so I think we can start off and then that was a bit, there we go, and then forward. Anybody out there who knows actually how to use one of these, I, I must apologise <laughs> because this must be painful viewing.
The next stage is to put some patches on where I'm going to punch through the tarp material and put in some grommets. And this is what I'm going to use for the reinforcements. This is a quite nice thick cotton canvas. This is actually a uh, it's the cover from a sofa bed. think <laughs> we're there with all the patches that are going to have grommets through them and then there were two extras so going back to the plan here there's this one and this one have tie-outs on I would quite like to put tie-outs all the way around it it's a much stronger fixing than using grommets but that's not the design I'm following so I'm going to try it as it as it is, as it's written there, and see what happens. I think that's all the sewing. Just lay it out and have a look. Let's see. That's it, the sewing is complete. Um, grommets next. There. So we've been through all the steps in making now, apart from attaching ropes and going camping. <laughs> At the end of materials needed is dye, uh, brown or green, and waterproofing. That's the only mention of either of those two things. That's it. Um, nonetheless, that's our next step. And now I'm going to waterproof all of this. As you can see we've relocated to the workshop and I'm wearing my painting coat because this next step I'm expecting it to get messy. I'm going to make some, what would I call it, waterproofing compound. <laughs> it's basically a uh, primitive oil paint. Uh, I've got all the ingredients here and it's going to be based on linseed oil. The recipe that I'm going to use for this um, goes way back. I've seen references to this kind of compound used well in the 1600s but I'm sure it's much, much older than that. So it's basically going to be linseed oil, something to, as a solvent for the linseed oil, which in this case is going to be white spirit, and a pigment, which is going to be burnt umber. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, interestingly, and um, actually I think it is interesting, uh, I've got three different types of linseed oil here. 
This is raw linseed oil. This is sold as a food supplement. I got this at the agricultural store. So it's some kind of food supplement for horses. I bought this for um, woodwork and I use it for spoons. So when I'm doing spoon carving, to finish the spoon, I soak it in raw linseed oil because it's food grade. It's a food grade product. Well, it is a food product. The trouble with raw linseed oil is it takes forever to dry. Now that's not a problem when you've just got a spoon, um, but if putting raw linseed oil on metalwork, for instance, is a disaster, and I've, yeah, I've been through that. <laughs> so what they did in the olden days, and the oldest recipe I found for what I'm gonna make, refers to linseed oil with things like um, sugar of lead and various other properly toxic compounds that you put in the linseed oil, and you boil it up, and that boiled linseed oil with those additives goes off much quicker. It cures, it doesn't dry, it cures. And we'll come to that in a bit as well. So modern boiled linseed oil like this, I use for tool handles and things like that because it soaks into the wood and then it polymerizes as it goes off, as it cures, it polymerizes, which means it makes a, a coating in the wood, which is really nice for, for things like wooden handles. So this is, treated to make it act like boiled linseed oil. That's what the modern, even though it says boiled linseed oil, it's not necessarily boiled in the refining process. It has dryers and things added to it. I have read that the downside of using this for waterproofing fabric is that it's somewhat acidic, so it will cause rotting of the fabric. Now I did think I could get around that by using a chalk compound for the colorant for the pigment, but I couldn't find one. Um, so I've gone with this burnt umber. And I also discovered I'd almost run out of oil. And when I went to order some more boiled linseed oil, I discovered that you can get double boiled linseed oil. <laughs> now it's, it's not just, it's not the same stuff as this. So Apparently what happens with the double boiled linseed oil is it is actually boiled um, in a vacuum and so it acts, this is much more like traditional boiled linseed oil. I'm going to mix this with an equal amount of white spirit. White spirit is known as um, mineral spirits in the US. It's just a, a petroleum distillate, a bit like paraffin I suppose. The idea of this is that it's a solvent to enable the oil to penetrate the fabric much better. This is way too goopy on its own to be used. So much like any other kind of oil paint, you have the base in there and then you have a solvent. The solvent enables the paint to be spread. The solvent evaporates off, leaving the paint behind. And the third and final ingredient is this burnt umber. As a child, I had a brief interest in oil painting, but I remember being fascinated by the exotic names that the colors uh, had. And it turns out they're not that exotic at all. Um, umber is just a clay. It's a highly refined clay, but it's, you know, clay, it's mud. <laughs> that comes from a place in Italy. And burnt umber is just the umber clay that's been heated up until it takes on this reddish brown color. Simple as that. But I have come across historical reference to using um, clays. Mm. <laughs> that tub's not going to be big enough, is it? No, we're near. All right, I'm going to get a bigger tub. One. You can just use the, uh, the white spirit and the uh, linseed oil, or linseed oil and the solvent, and paint that on, that would work. Um, the trouble with that is that you, if you're doing it on a white uh, sheet, like I am, it ends up a kind of, well, a vivid urine yellow from what, I, <laughs> from what I've seen in videos. That's not the look I'm going for with my tin. Some accounts that I've read the pigment aids in the waterproofing. Because it's a clay, it helps fill the gaps in the fabric because it's a quite an open mesh fabric. Now, good canvas is actually somewhat breathable, so I'm not sure 
not sure on that one, but this is part of what we're going to find out. A nice colour to it, but it's a bit pale yet. cup two cups and that was the whole jar gone in yeah definitely yeah. I'm just thinking I've painted many things in my life I'm halfway through painting the Land Rover. I've never painted a piece of cloth. It'll be totally new. I think the big brush is the way to go. It's a lot runnier than normal paint, so it's more like um, wood preservative or creosote. So we started out with 10 litres and 5 litre mark there, so we're way below that. Might be 2 litres left. So this is one coat and this is the inside of the tent currently. So by painting it on, even though it took a while, I could get a really nice distribution of the colour. It's, it's just gone on nice and even. So I shall have to leave that to dry for at least a week now before I can do anything else to it. And of course, when I say dry, the white spirit that's in there, the solvent, that will dry, that will evaporate. The uh, linseed oil, that will cure. So that will actually start to bond with the fabric. And this is the one bit of trivia that everybody knows about linseed oil when you apply it to cloths. Um, it, is capable of spontaneous combustion. The reason for that is the curing process of linseed oil is exothermic, so giving out heat as opposed to a lot of reactions that require heat to, to work. But this is, this is completely safe because this is stretched out, so any heat that's coming off of the fabric as, it, as the linseed oil cures will just harmlessly dissipate into the air. It's only going to be a problem if you have a a rag that's actually scrunched up. So no worries on that score. So that's all I can do for the minute. So that means there'll be a part two to this. In that part two, I'll finish off the tent and then I wanna pitch it and test its waterproofness and also see how it measures up against a couple of other canvas tents that I've got, which are quite similar in dimension to this. I got a Polish Lavu to test out and um, uh, a shelter half tent, a little pup tent. Plus I've got a British Army Basher and I think that's basically the modern equivalent of, of this. Same as you have in other armies, um, a Cy nylon tarp which you can set up as a tent which is very similar to this but a fraction of the weight. So we'll put all those head to head and see what they like and also I'll be interested to see how much just how much this weighs at the end of all this process and whether it's going to be feasible to take it on a uh, multi-day hike. Coming up next I'm going to make the second thing out of my four. Um, it'll probably be a little lantern. But that's it for now. I'll see you next time. Cheers.